So once you've diagnosed cardiorenal syndrome, what is our initial diuretic approach? Let's turn to our toolbox. The typical approach is to start with our intravenous loop diuretics, our trusty hammers that form the backbone of our toolbox. These include IV furosemide and IV bumetanide. The famous dose trial established safety for a protocol that starts with IV furosemide at a dose that is 2.5 times the patient's usual home diuretic dose. You can give that dose either with intermittent boluses or a continuous drip. If the patient does not take diuretics at home, IV Lasix 640 up to 80 mg is a reasonable starting point. How can we tell if our diuretic strategy is working? We can use traditional markers like looking for changes in exam, improvement in symptoms, as well as tracking weights and urine output. But these can take time and sometimes can leave you scratching your head, especially if things are inaccurately documented. Another marker to add to the mix is a spot urine sodium, which comes back quickly. Ideally, a urine sodium greater than 70 mL equivalents per liter, one to two hours after giving diuretics, indicates a good response. You do have to interpret that urine sodium in context. There are many confounders, like the amount of urine output, which can affect the measurement, and we discuss this in more detail in the full episode. If the response isn't adequate, escalating is often the next step. Double the daily loop diuretic dose and see what happens. So what if you're doing this and you're hitting a wall? There's not enough urine despite some pretty high doses of loop diuretics. This could indicate some developing diuretic resistance. First, make sure you actually have a diuretic problem and not a blood flow problem. This means thinking back to our water supply. For example, does the patient have a sicker heart than we thought and not enough output coming from there? Or maybe they have a sick liver and or their blood pressure is a little bit softer than we remember. Sometimes it can also be helpful to examine the urine again in case a different intrinsic kidney problem has emerged. Once you feel confident there is adequate flow and water supply, then we can go back to our toolbox and add on some next steps. The next strategy is often to add some tools to our loop diuretic hammers with what is called sequential nephron blockade to hit other parts of the nephron. The first of these additional tools are our thiazides, the drills that work in the distal tubule. These include metolazone or chlorothiazide. They also include chlorthalidone and HCTZ. These are more commonly used as antihypertensives, at least in the United States. Between metolazone and chlorothiazide, there aren't clear differences in efficacy, but some useful differences in their kinetics. Metolazone notably lasts quite a bit longer, while chlorothiazide is IV, so it's faster acting. Our next step of additional tools are our pliers of the proximal tubule. The first of these is acetazolamide. This was studied in the ADVOR trial, where it was shown to improve length of stay of heart failure patients when added to our loop diuretic hammers. Acetazolamide is helpful also with the pesky metabolic alkalosis that could come with using our other tools, but caution for swinging too far the other way to now acidosis, as well as for loss of your other electrolytes. Our other proximal plier is the famed SGLT2 inhibitor, which starts a little bit of our discussion about what our toolbox for home might look like. These are certainly an important part of long-term cardiac and renal medical therapy and can also aid in diuresis in the hospital. They are probably safe to add in cardiorenal AKI, though this is an ongoing area of study. Our last set of tools we'll talk about for now are the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, or MRAs. These are also an important part of our home toolkit, but can be helpful to add on in the hospital, especially to help with low potassium issues that come with all of our other tools. Spironolactone is probably the most common and familiar, as well as the cheapest of them, but has the most anti-androgen effects. Some other ones you may hear of in this family of tools are plerinone and most newly phenerinone, which is a more specific non-steroidal MRA. There are still ongoing studies about phenerinone's use in heart failure specifically. So to recap, here is the full general toolbox we have at our disposal, though even this is missing some of the more exotic tools that can be available in certain centers. There's a lot of overlap between the kits we can use in the hospital and the kits we use at home, and a lot of these tools end up being protective for the heart and kidneys in the long term. Thank you for listening, and please look at our full episode on cardiorenal considerations as well as diuretic resistance cases for more.